It's a blessing to be here today. I'm going to take a moment to connect my technology to our systems here. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you uh, again for inviting us here. Okay. All right, let's, let's start with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for this Sabbath day. Thank you for your son who gave himself for us. We pray that you would give us wisdom and strength this morning as we read and desire to understand your word. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. So the title of today's sermon is Seeing Jesus. And that's the idea we want to discuss this morning, the idea of seeing Jesus. And let's start with today's scripture. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 and verse 1, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Let's try to understand what's happening here in this verse This verse is built of two questions, question one, question two. And these questions are not rhetorical. They're not questions that are asked that you're not supposed to think about. These questions are more like a riddle. These questions work together to teach you something about the topic when you think about the questions. So let's try to understand question two so that we can understand what we're supposed to be thinking about. So question two says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Do you see that phrase, arm of the Lord? That's a poetic device. It's when you describe something by highlighting one part of it. So if I say, she is the brains of the operation, what am I saying? What does that mean? She's smart. Okay, what else does it mean? She, she's running the show, right? She, she's calling the shots. She's making the decisions, describing something to you about her in her place in the organization. What do you think it means when the Bible says, arm of the Lord? Okay, strength. What else? The executive. Right. Okay, because you use your arm to do things, Right? like I'm using my arm to hold this microphone. So the person being described symbolically is identified as the arm of God. He is that agent or part of God that is active, that does. He's the arm, right? The power of God. So this is who we're supposed to be thinking about. Think about how incredible a person this must be. This person 
is named or identified as the arm of God. If God is doing something, it's him. This is who we're talking about. And this is a person that needs to be revealed, okay? So let's look at this video in this next slide. I want you to take a look at this video, and I want you to just take a second to think about what stands out at you. Okay, and I'd like to hear what stands out at you in this video. Someone said trees. What else? What stands out to anybody? Sticks. Okay, someone saw sticks. A log. Okay. Did, did anybody look at that video and feel like nothing in particular stood out to them? I, I see at least one person shaking their head yes. Yeah? Okay, let's read verse 2. So we're in Isaiah chapter 53. Let's read verse 2. Can someone read it out loud for us? Oh, 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 oh. I'm going to try to get you mic'd here. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. In verse 2, the Bible explains that this incredible person who is named the arm of the Lord grows up out of the ground like one of those little sapling trees that you see under a maple. Or he sticks out of the ground like a root just coming out of the dry ground. And the significance of this is there's nothing about him for you to look at that would give you any indication that he is the arm of God. If you look at these little seedlings on the picture, you might look at the seedlings and say, well, I think that particular seedling is going to be bigger than all the rest of them because it's most in focus in the picture. Or I think the other seedling is going to be the biggest and the best out of all of them because it's the tallest one so far. The Bible is explaining to you that as you look at this picture, the arm of the Lord is a seedling that you don't notice. You don't see him. And that is not the exception. That is the rule. There's nothing about this powerful, active agent of God that stands out to your notice. We cannot sense the aspect of him that makes him the arm of God. We cannot sense his divine glory and power. That's hidden. So now we go back to verse 1. The second question says, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Unless the arm of the Lord is revealed to you, you will not see him. Let's say that another way. Our natural senses give us zero help in figuring out who Jesus is. If you want to know who Jesus is, there has to be a supernatural process that takes place to reveal Jesus to you. And now let's turn to a story in the Bible that kind of demonstrates this reality. We're going to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, we're going to read verses 3 through 9. Luke chapter 5, verses 3 through 9. Someone willing to read it for us in a clear, strong voice this morning? I see a hand. Five verses three to nine. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help, it, and help them. 
and they came and filled bo both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. Thank you so much. So let's look at this scripture together and let's answer some questions so we can clearly understand what's happening here. Let's look at verse 4. Jesus is done teaching and then he turns to Simon, who is also called Peter, and what does he say to him? He says, go out in the lake and do what? Put your net out for a catch. Let's go fishing. What is Peter's response in verse 5? Okay, why? So why, what is significant about the fact that they were fishing all night? Why were they fishing all night? Jakey. They wouldn't fish during the day. They would fish at night so the fish wouldn't see them. That's right. So I want to explain a couple of things to you. Peter is a professional fisherman. This is how he feeds his family. Okay, this is what he does. He's a fisherman. They fish all night because that's the best time to fish. So Jesus has been teaching at some point during the day, and then he turns to Peter and said, and who, by the way, Jesus is a carpenter, right? So he's, he's not a fisherman. He says, let's go out into the deep and let's cast your net out and catch some fish. And Peter says to him, essentially, I, I know about catching fish. And what you're saying to me is completely inconsistent with everything that I know about how fish are caught. But what's the last thing that Peter says there and at the end of that verse? We're looking at verse 5. He says, nevertheless, at your word, I will. What, what happened when Peter did something at Christ's word that he otherwise would never have done? What happened when he let his nets down? He caught a lot of fish. Was it like an ordinary a lot of fish? No. It was a supernatural amount of a lot of fish. It was so much fish that the nets were breaking. Okay? I think in another place in the Bible, the boats were sinking. It was an incredible amount of fish. Now, let's look at verse 8. What does Peter say when he saw this miracle? What does he say? Depart from me. Think about how he's feeling inside. Why, why is he asking Jesus to depart from him? I'm a sinful man, Lord. Don't, don't even, just, just, just depart from me. What is he saying? What is, what is he trying to express to Jesus? I'm not worthy. In other words, I can see that you and I are not on the same level. And when I opened my mouth to you to tell you about how fish should be caught, I didn't know who I was talking to. To Peter, in that moment, the arm of the Lord had been revealed. How was the arm of the Lord revealed to Peter? What did Jesus do to reveal himself to Peter? He, okay, Jakey. The shipping, uh, fishing methods uh -huh. to cause a supernatural, as you say, yeah, yeah. amount of fish to be caught. He created an opportunity for Peter to experience something supernatural. And that opportunity was locked behind an instruction. He said, Peter, go out into the deep and cast your net. That word was what provided Peter the opportunity to see Jesus for who he was. Peter had a choice. He could take it or leave it. And in his response, he said, there are a lot of reasons for me to leave this, but because it's you, because you have said it, I will do it. And that's how the arm of the Lord was revealed to Peter. There's a point I'm trying to make here. The point that I'm trying to make is that the arm of the Lord reveals himself through his word. If you want to see Jesus, I'm talking about if you want to see the arm of the Lord, if you want to see the power of God, you have to, choosing my verbs, you have, to, you have to choose to see it. And you choose to see it by believing in his word. Think about Isaiah 53, 1. It says, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Put those two thoughts together. 
the arm of the Lord is revealed to those who believe the report. Our being the prophets, right? Isaiah is a prophet. He's writing a prophecy about Jesus. And he's saying, who's believed what we wrote? Who's believed what we're teaching? Who's believed what we're preaching? And to whom, based off that first question of those who have heard the prophets and believed, has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Do you know that it was intentional that we should not be able to see Jesus with our eyes, like our natural eyes? Do you know that he did that on purpose? Let's, let's look at it in the Bible. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2, and let's read verses 5 through 8. That's Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, and I would appreciate a volunteer to read. I have one in the back. Thank you, Jakey. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, uh -oh. who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in like in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Thank you. Therefore. Oh. Thank you. We're, and we are coming to it. Thank you. So think about what the arm of the Lord did. All right, so let's look at the scripture. We're in Philippians. We're in chapter 2. We started at verse 5. Look at verse 6. It says that Christ Jesus was in the form of, form of who? God. And now the next little phrase, the Greek is a little nuanced, but in uh, New King James it says, it did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And that's an expression. What that means is, for Jesus to say, I am equal to God, is not a form of robbery. He's not o overreaching to say that. He's in the form of God, and he's equal to God, right? This is his condition at the beginning of the verse. But now look at the next little part. Look at verse 7, the beginning of verse 7. What does this arm of the Lord do at the beginning of verse 7? He, that's right. Some versions say made himself of no reputation. The words are literally he emptied himself. He emptied himself of the form of God. He emptied himself of everything that made it painfully obvious that he was equal to God. And instead, he took on the form of a, of a, of a servant, right? A, a human form, a form like ours. Let's remember what was written in Isaiah. He grows up out of the ground like one of those little seedlings that we saw on the screen. He made himself that way so that nothing about him would stand out to us and attract us and say, there he is, that's the arm of the Lord. He covered all that up. And then look what he did in verse 8. What did he do when he, after placing himself in this form? He humbled himself and was obedient even to to death that's right this is a powerful powerful thing he did why do you think he did it for us right what did it give us an opportunity to to do to be saved right yeah what else did it give us what did it give us an opportunity to experience I'm thinking about John chapter 1 or 1 John chapter 1. What are some of the things that Jesus did while he was on this earth? Yeah, that's right. He did it so that he could walk next to you, so that he could hold your hand, 
so that you could put your head on his shoulder, so that he could hold little kids and um, sit with them in his lap, right? In order to be as close to us as he possibly could, he emptied himself of his glory, okay? And that allowed him to be one with us, Emmanuel, God with us, with us just like we are with each other. It also allows us another opportunity. It allows us to exercise faith in his word, right? The, the, he looks just like you. He sounds just like you. He doesn't stand out to your senses as divine. But when you put faith in his word, that's when the arm of the Lord is revealed. And in order for us to have an opportunity to exercise that kind of faith, he had to empty himself of everything that would be the evidence of his divinity. So he put it behind faith. And faith is the key that unlocks the revelation for us all. Let's keep reading. So we're in Philippians chapter 2. Now let's read verses 9 through 11. Can someone read those verses for us? I have a hand here in the front. Okay. Highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you very much. So we read in verses 5 through 8 that Jesus humbled himself. And we just read in verses 9 through 11, therefore God highly exalted him. So we can see that there's a relationship between Christ humbling himself and God exalting him. But I want to show you something else. There's another relationship here. In verses 5 through 8, Jesus emptied himself. He emptied himself of his glory, the form of God, having a visible equality with God. And in verses 9 through 11, God, in response, gives him a name above all other names. And what I want you to understand that is his name is as powerful as is his glory. In fact, the name that he was given was given to him in order to, I don't want to say fix, but in order to address the fact that he emptied himself of his glory to come here to be with us. And it's that name that causes every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that he is Lord, okay? That's the name he received from his father. Let's look at a Bible verse. Let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 138, verse 2. And what we want to understand through this scripture is the relationship between the name of God and his word. Okay, we've already seen a relationship between God's glory and his name. And that seems pretty fair, right? Pretty obvious. But now let's see what is the relationship between God's name and his word. Can someone read that for us? Psalm 138 verse 2. Uh, share. Psalm 138 verse 2. I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. Thank you, Cher. What is the relationship between God's name and his word? Come on, y'all. Share, Pepper, come strong, come strong with it. Okay, okay, yeah, that's right. That, I don't have a Bible, a physical Bible to hold up for dem demonstrative purposes, but the, thank you, the Bible, can someone hold up a Bible? That Bible, which is, in a manner of speaking, it is the word of God, is regarded by God just as highly as his name. The name that he gave to Jesus for emptying himself, putting on humanity, being obedient even to the death of the cross, 
the name that was worth that, he regards his word just as highly. Do you see what I'm saying? On one side, we have God gave Jesus this name for his incredible incarnation, life, death, sacrifice, resurrection. On the other hand, we have his word. God regards that word the same way he regards his name, which means that God's word is, give me an adjective. Yeah, okay, yeah. It is, it is highly valued by God. It's also not a coincidence that his word is the means by which you can see the name of God, meaning it's through his word that the arm of the Lord is revealed. I want to make a, a point here. Just like when we're standing out in a field and we see a bunch of clovers in the grass, no one clover we can identify as being like super special above the rest of them. It's the same thing with truth. The thing about truth is to our senses, we might notice one thing or another thing but we're never going to figure out truth on our own. Truth is spiritual. And truth is something that God has to reveal to you. There's a supernatural process by which truth is revealed to our minds and hearts. And the same way that Peter was shocked to hear Jesus tell him to put his net in a certain place is the same way he was shocked to figure out who Jesus was in the first place. So the truth and Jesus, sorry, what I'm saying is that the truth, meaning Jesus, and truth as in the word of God, they both have to be revealed to us, and they both require faith. Sometimes God will ask us to do things through his word that make no sense to us. Sometimes we'll read something in the Bible, and we'll understand it, but it will seem irrelevant, outdated, inconsistent unscientific, it will just seem to be off. That's kind of how it felt for Peter when Jesus told him to go fishing in the middle of the day. But the, the person behind that word is the truth. It's Jesus. He's the arm of the Lord. And if he said it and you believe it, he puts himself as responsible for the results of that. That is the key to the Christian life. And that is the key to this precious time that we have here on this earth. The time that we have here on this earth right now is intended for us to develop a strong faith relationship with Jesus. To believe him, to believe his word more than we believe even our own senses. I'd like us to spend a little bit of time reading Revelation chapter 11. I'm uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 19. In fact, I'll read it. I'm starting at verse 11. I'm in Revelation chapter 19. The Bible says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no, no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. Who is that? That's Jesus. What do you know? What's interesting about his name? He has a name written, so it's visible, but what's, what's interesting about that name? He's the only one that knows it. And what do you think that would signify? Why do you think he's the only one that can read that name, that can know that name? Okay, it is symbolic of his equality with God. It is, the, it is a divine name. It is the Father's name. Nobody knows that name except for him, and then he has to share it with, with the rest of us. But he can read it as it's written, right? But what is he called? So, so we can't read the name that's written, 
But what is he called at the end of verse 13? The word of God, right? This is, a, this is a picture, like it's an image for you to see something. And what it's showing you is that when Jesus talks, he is saying what God is thinking. The word, the name written on him represents the thought of God. Nobody else can read that. But when Jesus speaks, his speech is the word of God. He is God's thought made audible, right? He is God's thoughts expressed. What's interesting here is that in Revelation 19, the name is written on him. It's visible. So let's keep reading. I'm at verse 14. And the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh, what's that? Another name, a name written. What is that name? King of kings and Lord of lords. This is a picture of Christ on his way back for, the, for, for his second coming. What, what do you think is going to be like when he comes a second time? Do you think anybody's going to resist him? You think anybody will be able to stop him? Do you think anybody will be able to deny his divinity? No, right? When he comes back the second time, there's not going to be any questions about who he is. Because when he is seen, he will be known. The Bible says in another place, people will say, hide us, hide us from the one who sits on the, on the, on the throne and from the lamb. They'll know exactly who he is the minute they see him. It will be obvious to all eyes. And in fact, the Bible says in another place, we just read it in Philippians 2, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Doesn't that, doesn't that raise a question in your mind a little bit? Any question? Why he didn't do this the first time? Why he didn't come like this the first time he came? Isn't there a whole great controversy about who, who is Christ and Satan wanting to um, ascend his throne to be worshipped as God and even now there's, there's confusion on earth and why didn't he come like this the first time? Okay, this time he's coming as a victor. Okay. It was through the first, through the first time he came is when he actually went and, uh, and beat the devil at his game. Yeah. This time he's coming back as the victor. Yeah. What he said is very important. He said the first time he came, we were all locked under sin. He had to come to defeat the devil. And what, what we need to understand is that had he come the first time this way, the way we just read in Revelation 19, we all would have known who he was, but none of us would have been saved by it. In order for us to be saved, he had to come the way he did the first time. He had to veil that humanity, um, veil that divinity in humanity. Uh, the first time was justification, and the second time is victory and emancipation. That's right. Faith is so important in our eternal place with God that he had to create an opportunity for us to develop that faith. So he didn't come back with all the evidence apparent in his person the first time. The first time it was inside, okay? And it's inside today so that we have a chance to develop that faith. When he comes back the second time, his name is written on the outside. Is, is, you, you will see it for yourself. But at that point, it's too late. The opportunity to develop the faith that you need has passed, okay? That's why we've been given that word, the Bible, the word of God. The Bible is our opportunity to exercise faith in the word of God, to believe him for who he says he is. And if we believe him today, when he comes back the second time with his name written on him, we'll be ready to receive him. Okay. Let's go over the scripture for the day one more time. Who has believed our report? Who is our 
the prophets who are, who are speaking on behalf of God? And what's the report? Okay, it's, it's everything that the prophets have said. All, all prophetically inspired word is their report, right? And who is the arm of the Lord? Jesus, right? Right. So who has believed the word of God? The, the one who has believed the word of God is the same one who has seen the word of God. Let's have a word of prayer to close. Thank you, Father, for revealing yourself to us in your word. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in your son. You gave us your son, and you also gave us the Bible. And with your son and with the Bible, we have everything we need to be prepared to live with you forever. Help us, Father, to have the kind of faith that is so strong that we will believe your word more than we believe our own understanding. Help us to trust in you with all our hearts and in all our ways to acknowledge you. And we know that you will make our paths plain and straight for us in return. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.